Georgia's DBHDD has an urgent health warning. One of every 10 counterfeit pills contain fentanyl, a powerful and very deadly drug. Pills from friends or dealers are unsafe, and one pill can cause an overdose. More info at opioidresponse.info. Welcome to the Georgia Today podcast from GPB News. Today is Wednesday, June 5th. I'm Peter Biello. On today's episode, a lawsuit filed against the state by prison health care provider WellPath is dismissed. Climate change brings a new tropical plant species to Georgia, and we'll have a comprehensive preview of the coming hurricane season. These stories and more are coming up on this edition of Georgia Today. A state judge has dismissed a lawsuit against Georgia agencies by prison health care provider WellPath over contract negotiations it said the state mishandled. A separate case against the state itself has yet to be resolved, but the lawsuit also raises concerns about prison health care conditions. GPB's Sophie Gratis has more. In the suit, WellPath alleged it didn't get a fair chance to negotiate a new contract with the Georgia Department of Corrections before the agency signed with Centurion Health, slated to take over services this summer. Those claims were dismissed, but WellPath also alleged that over three years, it spent millions of its own money to uphold the state's constitutional right to provide prisoners with adequate health care. That's included addressing a system-wide backlog of sick patients that the GDC confirmed and managing unexpected costs from prison violence. Before the GDC stopped reporting cause of death this February, homicides in Georgia prisons were on track to meet record high rates from 2023. Meanwhile, a federal investigation into prison conditions is ongoing. For GPB News, I'm Sophie Gratis in Macon. The number of white nationalist, anti-government, and other hate groups active in Georgia nearly doubled from 2022 to 2023. The Southern Poverty Law Center's annual report on hate and extremism released yesterday identifies 49 such groups in the state. It says hate groups have been emboldened by the mainstreaming of hard-right politics ahead of a presidential election cycle. The rise also coincides with Georgia's status as a swing state. Commissioners in Cherokee County, north of Atlanta, chose to uphold an equal partisan split on the local elections board, despite pushback from Republicans. GPB's Sarah Callis reports. Commissioners in the majority Republican county chose to appoint one Democrat and one Republican to the Board of Elections, continuing a historic equal split between the parties. Local Republican activists had advocated for the Democrat seat to be given to a Republican, leaving three Republicans and one Democrat on the Board of Elections. Several voting rights groups and Cherokee Democrats pushed back. Commissioner Richard Weatherby opposed the current split. We made a big mistake regarding the representation on the Board of Elections. Statistics prove out that approximately 75% of the votes cast in the last two elections have been Republican. Commissioners reappointed Larry Hand for the Republican seat and Scott Little to fill the Democrat seat. However, local Democratic Party Chair Nate Rich said Little is not known or active in the local Democratic Party. For GPB News, I'm Sarah Callis in Atlanta. As the climate warms, Georgia is seeing more plants and animal species that normally live somewhere else. The newest scientifically confirmed climate migrator in our state is the mangrove tree. The tropical plant thrives in warm, shallow waters and, in the U.S., is associated with places like Hawaii and Puerto Rico. Their northernmost documented location on the Atlantic coast was just north of the St. Johns River in Florida. But earlier this year, three biologists found several of them just north of the St. Mary's River. The National Park Service's Chaz Vervaki was one of them. All of us had the same reaction. We were like, holy cow. There are mangroves in Georgia. He says the discovery excited him because of its opportunity to educate people about climate change. Those are up here because our winters are less severe and we're having less severe freezes. Georgia winters have warmed an average of three degrees since 1970. That's according to Climate Central. Vervaki says the mangrove seeds were probably swept north by increasingly numerous and strong tropical storms. Between now and November, anywhere from 8 to 13 hurricanes are likely to form over the Atlantic Ocean. That's the highest range federal forecasters have ever projected for a hurricane season. But beyond the sheer number of storms, what else should Georgians be aware of? For that, GPB Savannah reporter Benjamin Payne spoke with Jamie Rome. He's deputy director of the federal government's National Hurricane Center. 
A lot of the discussion around hurricanes revolves around Florida, and understandably so, since hurricanes make landfall more often in that state than any other. But of course, Georgia is Florida's next door neighbor. A hurricane can hit Florida first before barreling north, as we saw last year with Hurricane Adalia hitting the Valdosta area hard. What should Georgians be preparing for this year? This is a great question, and it speaks to feedback that we're hearing from inland residents that they want to see more focus on the inland aspects of these hurricanes. This has really come to a head more so in the last few seasons as we've had several storms that retain sort of their strength and wind speed and cause a tremendous amount of destruction well inland. So, you know, my message to these inland communities is, you know, hurricanes can carry that strong wind inland. Often they're weakening as as they're traversing these inland communities, which can give people the false sense of security. Oh, it's weakening. It's not as strong as it was. But there are unique aspects of the inland communities that make them particularly more vulnerable sometimes to the, the inland wind. Sometimes the soil, like I grew up in North Carolina, where the soil is clay, And what happens is the tree roots don't grow down, they grow out laterally. And so that makes them easier to topple. So the trees topple, you get power outages, blocked roads, um, sometimes the trees fall on homes. Um, So it's really important to take these inland systems seriously, even though they're they're weakening, um, because they can really do a, a tremendous amount of damage. In Savannah, where I am, people often talk about the threat of a hurricane as coming through either the front door or through the back door, as I've heard it put. The front door being the Atlantic Ocean and the back door being inland areas where a hurricane comes up north from the Gulf Coast and into southwest Georgia. Are there any important differences between Atlantic hurricanes and Gulf Coast hurricanes, aside from the obvious fact of where they make initial landfall? Well, I certainly understand that way of trying to categorize storms. It's natural for humans to want to categorize things to make them more simple to understand. But hurricanes are kind of like people. You imagine if you took all personalities and you tried to put it in one or two types, right? You know, you would lose some information in overgeneralized personalities. Um, The same can be said with hurricanes. If you try to put them in back door, front door, you're going to lose a lot of critical information. And instead, we need people to focus on the specifics of that storm. It's possible that in one case, a backdoor scenario can produce more impacts than a front door scenario or vice versa. You know, that categorization is not teasing that out. So, you know, I really want people to think more deeply about storms and avoid that sort of oversimplification. A big reason this year's hurricane season is forecast to be above normal is because La Nina is likely to form. Can you explain what this climate pattern exactly is and why it's more conducive to hurricanes than El Nino? Yeah, so El Nino and La Nina, collectively called ENSO, is warming or cooling of the ocean in the Pacific. Now, what does that have to do with us in the Atlantic? It changes the global atmospheric conditions. In one phase, produces atmospheric conditions that are not conducive for hurricanes, that's El Nino. And the opposite, La Nina produces uh, atmospheric conditions that enable hurricanes to form and, and become stronger. So we're trending towards this latter, but there are other factors at play. El Nino and La Nina tend to dominate the discussion, but there's probably five to eight other factors happening that control hurricane activity, and they don't tend to get discussed as much Um, The the other thing, too, is when you're trending from one to the other, right? So, you know, we're trending towards La Nina. It's not a switch. It's not like you flip a switch and the lights come on. The reaction or the the forcing that happens from, from La Nina that helps hurricanes form is not instant. So it really depends on how quickly La Nina develops. And then there's a little bit of a lag in the response, too. So there's still a lot we don't know about the season and how it's going to play out. And so that uncertainty means that as a citizen, you really have to just be prepared and uh, you know, not get too bogged down in the hype um, and just really focus on yourself and, and making your family ready. Can you explain what wind shear is and what it has to do with hurricanes? It's one of those factors that I see hurricane watchers bring up from time to time. So wind shear is basically like the winds in the jet stream. So, you know, if you fly on a commercial flight, 
sometimes the headwinds slow you down and sometimes the tailwinds speed you up and you get to your location sooner or, or later than you hope. And, and sometimes those winds cause turbulence and cause the flight to be rougher than normal. So that's basically what wind shear is, is you know, how much do the winds get stronger as you go up, climb in the atmosphere. And hurricanes don't like that at all. They, they like the winds to be consistent from top to bottom, meaning they don't like any sort of change in the winds above them than sort of at their feet. Um, and then if we go into a La Nina, what tends to happen is the wind shear decreases, goes down, um, and that's what supports storms forming. Any final advice for those of us here in Georgia? Yeah, you know, I mean, do what I'm doing. I've spent last weekend in my garage testing and tuning up my generators, making sure that they're ready and you know everything's situated, making sure the supplies were kind of where I thought they were. You know, my garage is kind of like everybody else's garage. You know, it becomes sort of the dumping grounds for all of these miscellaneous things. So, you know, I made sure my supplies were where I thought they were, dusted off a few things, added a few things, you know, nothing really big because I've prepared every season, you know, just do the small stuff to make sure you're ready. Because when you do it in advance of a storm, everybody else is trying to do the exact same things. The roads are crowded, long lines, you can't get what you need supplies are out, can't get fuel because everybody's trying to, you know, all the procrastinators are trying to do it at the exact same time. So you'll make your life so much less stressful if you just go through the motions now and do the small things to prepare. Thanks so much for your time, Jamie. I really appreciate it. All right, man. Take care. That was National Hurricane Center Deputy Director Jamie Rome speaking with GPB Savannah reporter Benjamin Payne about what to expect from the Atlantic hurricane season. It officially began over the weekend and runs through the end of November. And as hurricane season gets underway, the Home Depot Foundation is gifting $6 million to nonprofits to assist them with storm readiness. The nonprofit arm of the Atlanta-based home improvement retailer is aiming to equip response organizations across the country in hard-to-reach areas with the necessary supplies for timely disaster response. The grants include a Mercy Corps Caribbean Resilience Initiative, which will provide supplies throughout Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands. Atlanta officials say workers finished repairs on a ruptured water main last night. They say water problems in the city are coming to an end after five days. But people are still under a boil water advisory in downtown and some nearby areas. In sports, a two-time winner of Atlanta's Peachtree Road Race has been stripped of his world record in men's 10-kilometer road racing and banned for six years in a doping case. Kenyan runner Ronex Caprudo won the Atlanta race in 2019 and 2022. A disciplinary panel ruled that abnormalities in Caprudo's blood samples pointed to doping. At the time, he was aiming to qualify for the last Summer Olympics in Tokyo. Atlanta Dream guard Ryan Howard was selected to represent the United States in three-on-three basketball at the Summer Olympics. She'll join fellow women's basketball stars Cameron Brink, Sierra Burdick, and Haley Van Lith in Paris. Her three teammates led the U.S. to a gold medal in the 2023 FIBA World Cup. And baseball fans can now vote for the 2024 All-Stars. Major League Baseball made the ballot available today for fans to select which players to send to Texas for the All-Star Game next month at the home of last year's World Series champion Rangers. During the first voting period, running until June 27th, fans can select one player at each infield position, one catcher, one designated hitter, and three outfielders in each league. The ballot is available at MLB.com. And that is it for this edition of Georgia Today. If you want to learn more about any of these stories, visit gpb.org slash news. And remember to subscribe to this podcast. We'll be back tomorrow with all the top stories from Georgia. And if you've got feedback or a story we should know about, email us. The address is georgiatoday at gpb.org. I'm Peter Biello. Thanks for listening. We'll see you tomorrow.